Well, good evening, everybody. It's good to be back with you um, on our Hidden Treasures course. And we're on module four, but we're on part three because we're taking our time with this module, which is lies, libels and replacement theology. And uh, we're moving tonight into replacement theology. And that's something which is actually rampacked with uh, replacement the theology tonight. And some of you might find it's a little bit difficult um, and, and, and very challenging, I'm sure, to most of you who may be from a traditional church background or still in a traditional church and you might find some of the things that uh, i present tonight quite uh, uh, challenging to you uh, so i hope that you can uh, appreciate that I, I want to try and bring these to you as factual uh, things that that take time to learn and take time to process so um, as we move through tonight's session if you have any questions, please, please email me with them and uh, I'll try and answer you, answer you in the best way I can. But I don't want to offend anybody at all and I don't want to uh, give you undue concern or uh, or worries. But but uh, what I will bring to you tonight are factual uh, things that come uh, from our history as a ch in church history. And uh, some of the and some of the things that I will say to you tonight uh, uh, have resulted in as as a, as a Christian community worldwide to become a major persecutors of the Jewish people because of the polarization of uh, the early church and the and the Jewish people and um, enabled the Holocaust to take take place, which is our next session next week. We'll be looking at Holocaust. So this is a kind of a forerunner to it. Now we've looked quite a lot at. Uh, at um, uh, Christian anti-Semitism in history and we'll continue to look at that but I, in, in the same way tonight but I want to look at more at anti-Christian Judaism tonight and you'll see that how that works out and how um, I develop that uh, narrative and the, present to you some of the facts that uh, uh, that are the basis of Christian anti-Judaism so uh, as we move into this third part of module four, which is quite a big module, I hope that you can bear with me and uh, and, and, and and stay the course really uh, before we go on to the next session next week, which is Holocaust. Before I move on as well, I want to present some books to you which might help you. There are a lot of books on this subject, uh, an array of books um, talking about uh, replacement theology and how the church developed over the early years and, and how the church practices today, which is quite different from how we practiced in the very early church. Now, I, I could bring you many of these books, but I thought I'd bring you some really unusual books that you, maybe you won't uh, see otherwise. Um, this is uh, um, Caesar and the Christ by Will Durant, the historian. That's quite an interesting book, quite a heavy read, really. It's about um, uh, the the history of uh, of Christianity within the Roman Empire um, and how that developed. Also, I've got a good book by David Flusser, Judaism and the Origins of Christianity. That's uh, David Flusser. That's quite a good book. Um, you can't agree with everything in these books, but the, uh, the, I recommend you read them. Um, I, I really value the the history that David Flusser, uh, Judaism and, and the origins of Christianity has in this book. And um, another book, which is by E.P. Sanders, which is a really good book. E.P. Sanders is an amazing historian, very knowledgeable uh, on, on first century uh, Judaism and the history of the temple as well. And, and this one is an excellent book. It's uh, a Jewish law from jesus to the mishnah um so a really good book again if you want to uh, delve deeply into the history of the church and also uh, on a lighter note we're going to be looking at the feasts and the festivals uh, the appointed times of god and how the uh, early church changed those to go back to paganism um, and uh, to help with understanding the feasts themselves, there's a little book here um, by Richard Booker, which is a, a great little book, uh, uh, 
the uh, it's Jesus in the in the feasts of Israel, and it's a great little book. It's easy to read. It's only small. The other books are quite heavy, but this will give you an idea of uh, how God intended us to to keep the feasts, and also for us as uh, believers in Yeshua, how He fulfilled them. So it's it's a nice little book, and that's available on uh, on Amazon, and you can get that quite quickly. It's constantly being reprinted. It's a very good and easy book. So I'm going to go to my notes now, which are on the the PowerPoint that I uh, prepared, and you, you have most of these notes in your manual, so um, uh, you don't have to take a, a, a great deal of uh, notes tonight they, a lot of them are in your manual so um i want to go back though just to to remind us where we were when we finished last week we were looking at synods and church councils which um created laws that stopped jews from marrying christians and in fact were the foundation foundations really of the um nuremberg laws that uh, hitler and the nazi party created and uh, if you perhaps you perhaps don't remember but we looked at quite a lot of uh, at church councils and uh, and uh, for instance the fourth lateran council 1215 uh, required Jews to wear special clothing to distinguish them from Christians, and and uh, and then the Church Council in Oxford in 1222 ordered all Jews to wear a yellow star. Was very uh, clearly um, where Hitler got his idea about Jews having to wear distinctive clothing and a yellow star in the years prior to the Holocaust. So that's what we finished with last week, and now uh, this week I want to look at. A continuation of that narrative, but bringing us into anti-Judaism. And now, Theodosius the Great um, was a, a, a Roman emperor who, between 379 and 395 AD, and he was the emperor who made Christianity the official state religion of the Roman Empire. Now, that type of Christianity wasn't the Christianity that, that Yeshua, Jesus, um, taught us to keep. It wasn't the type of Christianity that Paul taught us to, to follow, or the disciples taught us to follow. It was a, a mixture of, uh, of early Christianity, Gentile Christianity, Mithraism, and Isis worship. Now, what the Theodosius did, he barred Jews from holding any official position, and, and he ordered that their synagogues would be destroyed. Now, I, I want to mention that uh, Theodosius the, the, the Great was also a Babylonian priest, and I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail later on. But the, um, uh, the first pope in Rome... I want to move to that place. In 381 was a man called Damasus, and he was the Bishop of Rome who took on the role of Babylonian priest and Bishop of Rome and ultimately became the first Pope. The story of Peter becoming the first Pope or even being in Rome at all during his life uh, is, is questionable. And certainly, without a doubt, historians can will say that the first pope, the first pontiff, pontiff meaning bridge between uh, earth and heaven, pontiff is a, a bridge, um, he was the first uh, pope in Rome. Um, there was no other pope before him. Um, so, and that was in 380, 81 AD. And I'm going to look at that whole picture of how he became pope and what happened a bit later on. Now, I want to take us to um, a time when, uh, after the early synods and councils ordered that uh, Gentile believers, Christians as they were then called, were not allowed to keep uh, Sabbath as, as the, the early church had done, and were not allowed to keep Passover, etc. Uh, as those synods and councils developed, then the United Kingdom, which was which had been uh, missioned by people like Patrick and uh, Columbus, uh, Killy as he was known, um, and taught to keep 
the appointed feasts of God from Leviticus 23, which we're going to later on. Um, the, the British, if you like, the, the Celts, the Welsh, the Irish, and the Scottish, and the people from the, the, the English in Northern England kept those original biblical feasts. As the synods and councils developed and Rome began to enter the British um, Isles as a missionary uh, community, then the British uh, were forced, or the English, certainly in Northern England, were forced to change their calendar of worship away from the appointed feasts that God had given in Leviticus 23, in which the early disciples of Yeshua and Paul, as I've said, taught us to keep, they were forced to change. And the first change was made at a place called Whitby, which is in the north of England. Um, and that was in 664 AD. And the, the situation there was that a man called Wilfred, who was an emissary of Rome, an emissary of then the Catholic Church, uh, came to the British Isles. Uh, he was British. And he went to this community at Whitby, which was the community that uh, Columbus had originally planted and started as a Christian community in the north of England. And he uh, 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 had meetings with the leaders of that community in an effort to make them change from the calendar of worship that they'd been taught to keep, which was the appointed feasts of God, Sabbath through Passover through to Tabernacles. And he uh, told them that Peter, the apostle, was actually um, somebody in Rome who wanted to change the feast of Passover to the feast of Easter, which is actually the feast of Ostra, the fertility goddess. And, and you, you, you'll get the idea from that where, where we today in Christianity wrongly keep the symbols of the egg and the rabbit as, as symbols of the Passover when actually they're not the symbols of the fertility goddess Ostra. And Wilfred wanted the uh, Whitby community to change. And he also wanted to, to change from Sabbath to Sunday because that was the, uh, the day that, if you remember, um, Constantine had changed as a day of rest in the empire to Sunday in honor of uh, Sol Invictus, the sun god. So Wilfred, as an emissary, uh, came and, and uh, uh, taught this to the uh, Whitby community and actually said that uh, Peter would, wouldn't be pleased if they didn't change from Passover to Easter and from Saturday to Sunday. And therefore, the Whitby community changed those days of worship and actually change the names as well. And if you want to uh, have a look at that in more detail, the, uh, the internet has a lot of information on that, but you can also buy books on, on that particular uh, time in Whitby. But try the internet first. Now, sometime after that, up, sometime up to 722 AD, um, and Augustine from Rome, the second Augustine, came to Wales with the same narrative um, to try and get the Welsh now to change from Passover to Easter and from Saturday to Sunday. And he attended uh, conferences with the Welsh church leaders at a place called Cheltenham, which is in the south of Wales on the border and a place called Bangor on Dee, which is uh, in the north, northern border, not far from where I live, but probably about uh, uh, 20 miles from where I live. Now, in Bangor on Dee, there was a community of about 1,200 Christians. Uh, the, the history books say that they were, they were uh, monks, but actually the, the, it was a Christian community. If you look at the makeup of that community, it was men, women, and children, and they were living in Bangor on Dee, right along the river uh, Dee, keeping the appointed feasts that God had asked them to keep through the apostles and um, through Paul. And, uh, and, they were, and they were confronted by Augustine, who did his very best to get them to change their minds uh, 
about changing from Saturday to Sunday and from Passover to Easter. But the Welsh believers refused completely. And in on one day, um, uh, Augustine had the king of Northumbria come to uh, Bangor on Dee and actually murder every single one of those uh, 1,200 believers because they refused to change. And from then on, we see in Welsh history that um, um, it's, it's, things changed very uh, slowly and, and the Welsh resisted everything everything that Rome brought to Wales and actually um, they held out and they didn't the Welsh didn't change to Easter until 768 AD but regarding Sabbath the Welsh held out um, against Rome for changing from Saturday to Sunday until 1115 AD when the Bishop of Bangor actually uh, forced the Christians in Wales to change from Sabbath to Sunday, and that was 1115 AD. Now the Scots and the Irish kept Sabbath until 1175 because they held out a little bit longer. And, um, and, and Rome uh, forced by execution people to ch make those changes. So it wasn't a, by necessarily agreement as it was in Whitby, it was by force. It was as uh, we saw with the Bangor on Dee uh, Christians there. Now, we also see that, that uh, Christianity right throughout the centuries has been a violent uh, uh, military movement, which is totally unlike how Christianity was first uh, um, created by the early apostles this military um, idea came out of the Roman emperors and uh, we, we see it probably at its worst in the Crusades when a, a series of military campaigns uh, sanctioned by the Pope took place during the 11th and the 13th century Originally, the Crusades were Roman holy, Catholic holy wars to recapture Jerusalem and the Holy Land from the Muslims because Muslims had, uh, had, had taken over Jerusalem. But some of these Crusades were directed at Jews. So as uh, the Crusaders went through Europe on the way to Jerusalem and, uh, and as they encountered Jewish communities on the way, they murdered them, they slaughtered them, they destroyed the synagogues, they raped the women and, um, and uh, 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 killed people in the name of Jesus. And you, you're also wearing um, a, a red cross on a white background. Not at all the crusade, crusaders wore that, the leaders certainly did, but people did murder in the name of Jesus. And, um, and that, that was a, a, a vicious attack upon the Jewish communities as they traveled through um, uh, Europe on the way to Jerusalem. We also see another effort by the Church of Rome to, um, to root out what they called where um, people, uh, Jews who, were, who said they were converted to Christianity, but in actual fact kept uh, keeping uh, kept their Jewish festivals or the God's festivals actually Sabbath through Passover to to uh, the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, and the Inquisition was to root out those and also to um, try and root out uh, uh, Christians believers who also kept Sabbath and uh, and Passover and Tabernacles so so the Inquisition was part of that movement by the church to stop people keeping the God's appointed feasts, which the Jewish people were asked to, by God to, to keep um, so that we, we, we would see God through these particular feasts. Now, the Inquisition was a legally constituted court decreed by Sixtus the Ninth's papal bull and implemented under King Ferdinand and Is Isabella of Castile and that was in Spain. The in investigations and torture of thousands of Jews was carried out by the Catholic Church led by a monk called Thomas de Torquemada 
Now, the Vatican was concerned, as I've said, with the idea of new converts following what they described as non-Christian ways of life, as I say, keeping Sabbath and the Levitical feasts. Certain uh, behaviors were labeled by the church as Judaizing and were strictly prohibited under punishment of death. As of 1478, any convert suspected or accused of Judaizing was tried and put uh, um, and, and tried under uh, something called the Act of Faith. And uh, if they were found wanting with that, they were executed. The Inquisition published the following guidelines, and I'm quoting these guidelines as a translation from the uh, Spanish. If you see that your neighbours are wearing clean and fancy clothes on Saturdays, they are Jews. If they clean their houses on Fridays and light candles earlier than usual on that night, they are Jews. If they eat unleavened bread and begin their meal with celery and lettuce during Holy Week, they are Jews. If they say prayers facing the wall, bowing back and forth, they are Jews. This was all a way of identifying um, uh, Jews within the Spanish community. Now, the Inquisition didn't, it wasn't just the Spanish Inquisition because the Inquisition from the Catholic Church went to, uh, to South America, India, Goa, um, where they tried to root out anybody who was keeping Sabbath. And that's very important. Later on in this presentation, you'll see how I bring that into play with regard to the UK and Sabbath as well, as late as the 17th century. Now, uh, let's look at the Lord's Feast, the appointed feasts. Now, I know for you, Shirley, who are watching this in, um, in Canada, you're Jewish and you will know uh, the appointed feasts of God because you've been brought up with them it's you hold them very closely and dearly and and uh, and celebrate them very specially and uh, which is what we should do as christians and and some of you out there will know them because you'll be part of communities like mine where we keep sabbath and we keep uh, the feasts of the lord so uh, but for those of you who don't know i'm going to just go through them very quickly and I'm talking about the Lord's Feasts in Leviticus 26, sorry, 23. Uh, and I'm going to start with this, uh, the, the, this place with scripture in Leviticus. If you, if you want to turn to Leviticus 18, verses 3 and 4, God says to the Jewish people, don't do as they do in Egypt. And don't do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm taking you to. Do what I tell you to do and keep my times, my seasons and my laws. That's what he's saying. And, and uh, what he means by this is that when, when the Jews were 430 years in Egypt, they were, they were uh, assimilated to an extent in Egyptian society. And they worshipped as the pharaohs did. They worshipped the cow, they worshipped the calf, they worshipped other deities, they worshipped the pharaohs. They'd been there a long time, as 430 years they'd been in, in Egypt. And, um, and, and clearly they, they, they still had calf worship in, 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 inside them because when they get to the Sinai, uh, they, as we see with Aaron, he, they go back to calf worship when Moses is on the Sinai. So God wants them to extract themselves out of the ways of the Egyptians. That's why he says this in, in Leviticus 18. And he wants them to be prepared to go into the land of Canaan, where he's taken them, where they celebrate also the deities. And he wants them to celebrate his feasts, which he put in place before the foundation of the earth, because we see from Genesis 1.14, that God put the stars in the sky so that we would know the times of the Sabbath and the feasts, the appointed times, the Moedim. If you look at a, a, a correctly translated uh, Bible, you'll see that, that it's the appointed times that God put the stars in the sky for us to know when they are. 
Then we turn to Leviticus 23, 2, and we see that God tells us, tells the Jewish people to keep the Sabbath, which is the seventh day, not the first day. The first day is the day to Sol Invictus, the, the, the sun god. He says then, if you if you read uh, uh, Leviticus 23 or, or this book by Richard Booker, you'll see uh, that God says then celebrate Passover on the 14th day of the first month. Now, the first month um, was inaugurated by God. And then two weeks later, we should celebrate Passover. So that that's God's appointed feast. And the thing is, when you look at the first verse of Leviticus 23 it says these are my appointed feasts so they're not the feasts of the Jews if you like they're God's feasts and God asks the Jewish people to celebrate them to show the rest of the world how we should worship God so so the J Jewish people are like a servant of God teaching the rest of the world which day to rest on and and what celebrations to to keep but of course the world ignored that and um, and uh, walked away from the jewish people and began to persecute them now the feast of unleavened bread is mentioned as well and that's a seven day feast and then we have the feast of weeks uh, shavuot which is uh, actually next weekend is shavuot um and that's um uh, the feast that, that comes 49 nine days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, and, and, and the Jewish people have a tradition of counting the Omer up to that time. So, so we're, we're at the end of the counting of the Omer, uh, which will take us to Shavuot next weekend. And then the Feast of Trumpets, um, which is very, very important for um, uh, the, the Christian uh, or the uh, the Christian community, because we believe, and Jewish people don't believe this, but we believe that that Yeshua will come back with the sound of the trumpet, um, and and that he will come back and he will uh, redeem the Jewish people and uh, protect them from the nations from that time onwards. And then we have the Day of Atonement, which is a, a very very solemn day in the calendar where we reflect on. Uh, what we've done has our sin against each other and against God and and we believe as um, as as believers in Yeshua that the day of atonement is is something that Yeshua fulfilled in atoning for our sins so we we not able to go to the temple to sacrifice an animal his blood we say cleanses us of our sins so that's the day of atonement and then the feast of tabernacles which is about God dwelling with man God dwelling in the in the desert, tabernacling with the Jewish people in the desert. And we believe at the end of time that when Yeshua comes back, God in him will dwell with man for the millennium, the thousand year reigns. So these are they're the appointed feasts that God gave to the Jewish people to demonstrate God's immense uh, uh, love for the for people and also the significance of the spiritual realm in regard to the worship of God himself but what about the feasts that we keep in Christendom well the, the, I've mentioned how they changed I've talked a little bit about that I mean it's a huge story that actually but and I, I will go into a little bit more about that but um the the church today actually celebrates the pagan feasts that were being celebrated by the romans in the first second third and uh, fourth century by the roman emperors who actually enforced that people would keep these feasts now the feast of saturnalia which is the the feast um, that is a, a, a week-long festival to at the winter solstice date starts on the 21st of December and it celebrates the birth of Mithras and Canaanis. It's not the birth of Yeshua. We believe if we look at the Feast of Tabernacles that Yeshua would have been born around the Feast of Tabernacles and, and, and scripture makes that very clear. The, 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 the shepherds on the hillside wouldn't be on the hillside 
in the middle of winter, they would have been on the hillside in Bethlehem at the Feast of Tabernacles, looking after the sheep which were ready for slaughter for the feast. And the feast speaks about God dwelling with man. So, so that's what what we believe. How you sure you sure fulfilled that? But um, Christmas, as we see it today, is the celebration of Mithras, who was actually in mythology was born on the twenty fifth of December, and and Mithras um, symbols are the holly, the ivy, and the fir tree. Now that I've mentioned the Feast of Ostra, which was a Roman celebration of fertility, and that was the celebration of the fertility goddess Ostre um, on the 21st of March. <clears throat> and as I've mentioned, her symbols are the egg and the rabbit. And then we have the Sunday worship, uh, the weekly worship of the god Mithras or Sol Invictus, the sun god. And that was officially from 321 AD, the day of rest in Rome under the command of the um, Roman Emperor uh, Constantine. Now, we I mentioned this god, Cananis. Now, Cananis is actually um, a, 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 a god, a Roman god, who, today, who is symbolized as the green man. Now, I, I don't know whether you can Google this, but if you Google the green man, you'll see a, a, a picture of a man with a face with, with leaves all around him. He is the green man. He is reborn. And, and his celebration, the Roman celebration of Cananis, is at what is known today as All Souls Day or Halloween. Now, if you were to go into a traditional Anglican Church in Wales or in England today and in parts of Scotland, you will come across this green man depicted in stained glass windows on the in the rooftops, in the arches, uh, carved into seats. You'll see this picture of this funny looking man which has leaves around his head. That's the god Cananis. And we've got so diverted away from our original uh, Judaism in the church that, that actually to, still today, the depiction of Cananis, the god Cananis, is, is held in high esteem in, uh, in Christian circles, particularly within the cathedrals. So if you were to go into Manchester Cathedral, which is about an hour's drive from me, you'd see there are over a thousand green men in the architecture of the cathedral. And school children would go there and the, 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 the cathedral um, guides actually have competitions asking children to find the god, or to find the green man who is the god Canonis. Lincoln Cathedral sells plaques of the green man. And um, I think they're about 15 pound each now, but why are we doing that? when God says, do not keep a, a graven image. Now, all this, I, all, all this I've been talking about is replacement theology or replacement Judaism, if you like. Now, I want to go back now so it's, to how it happened. Shortly after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, Gentile followers of Yeshua began to lead the church in the form of bishops. So, so after the destruction of the temple, the followers of Yeshua, who were Jews in the main, fled. And when they fled to the diaspora, Gentile leaders began to take control. And we looked at that two weeks ago now, I think, when we looked at Marcion and, uh, and, and church leaders who, when they took control of Christianity, tried to drive out Judaism and the Jewish people from uh, the, 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 this new faith Christianity, which actually is in reality just a continuation of Judaism, believing that Yeshua is the Messiah. I hope you understand, understand that. Now, um, many of those who kept to Judaism, many of the believers, were um, were martyred under this new leadership and under the Roman emperors. <clears throat> 
Now, after the destruction, uh, destruction 200 years onwards after, it was illegal to keep the Sabbath and the feasts. And, uh, and, and clearly, if you did, you were executed. And we saw that with Marcion and the Justin Martyr. I'm not going to go over that because we've done that. Um, so just go back in, uh, on, on to session one, or, or, sorry, part one and two of, mo of this module, and uh, you'll re refresh your memory about the early church fathers. Now, replacement theology, the idea that the church has replaced the Jews is uh, is what I would call fake news today. God hasn't finished with the Jewish people by any means. Um, but we see the church has portrayed them as having lost their authority in God. And, um, and uh, we see that in churches. If you, you'll have to access the internet again, but if you access the internet and look for uh, things within churches, which talk about ecclesia and synagogue. You'll see stained glass windows in churches throughout Europe where we see that the church is um, displayed by um, ecclesia, who is a female who has a crown and actually has a, a, a staff of authority with a cross on it. And on the next part of the um, uh, picture in the stained glass windows you'll see synagogue who is displayed as a as the jewish people a lady again jewish people with a crown which is fallen you'll see the pictures and her staff her authority is broken and that's how replacement theology was taught you know the idea that the church replaced the jews that's how it was taught in churches with people who couldn't read now um I, I want to move now to the uh the, the story of of this pope damasus and how he became a babylonian priest now this is hard to follow on i, I know none of tonight's session is really easy for you to follow and, and it's quite challenging isn't it but i want to talk about this uh, pope damasus and how he got to this place and how, as a Babylonian priest, he became a pope. Well, we must go back to the time of uh, the, the a Tower of Babel, where Nimrod creates a tower, which is a tower which did exist physically, archaeologically, we know it existed, in Babylon at the time of Nimrod. And it was a very high tower, that at, on the top of it has a chapel and in the chapel was the worship up to the sun and to other deities and um, there was a particular priesthood uh, uh, who would carry out worship on behalf of the people at the time of Nimrod now um, this is fact now this is, uh, um, and I first picked up this story about 20 years ago from a book uh, called the dispensational truth by Clarence Larkin, and, uh, and and Larkin mentions this story in this book, and how Damasus became this Babylonian priest, and I'll tell you the story. So the Babylonian priesthood in the in the chapel in the Tower of Babel, the time of Nimrod, was worshiping the worshiping the sun on behalf of the people. But after Babylon was overrun by the Medo-Persians, the Babylonian priesthood fled to a place called Pergamon. Now, John the Apostle in the book of Revelation mentions Pergamon because Pergamon was over the, over the sea from where he was in Patmos. And um, he calls Pergamon the seat of Satan. Now, why would he call that place the seat of Satan? Because the Babylonian priesthood, who were sun worshippers, had fled and settled there. And as the Medo-Persians uh, moved on and were taken over by the Greeks, 
The Medo-Persian gods were taken in by the Babylonian priests at Pergamon and added to their uh, a list of deities to worship at Pergamon. And also the Greek gods were worshipped at Pergamon. So when the Roman Empire take over from the Greeks, the Greek uh, the Romans then add their deities, Jupiter, Zeus, and all their deities to the Babylonian priesthood de deity uh, system of worship. And the Roman emperors make Pergamon the center of their place of worship for the whole of the Roman Empire. So if you were a, a, a Roman Empire a, a emperor, you would go to Pergamon to worship. It was the, the place to worship uh, uh, many deities and many other gods. And, uh, and, and if you were a, 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 in a high flyer, if you like, in the Roman Empire, you went on your holidays to Pergamon and you worshipped there. It was, it's a bit like the Caesarea is, was in, in uh, Israel uh, in the first century when Yeshua went there. The Roman soldiers would worship all these gods at a place called Caesarea. And... Um, and Pergamon was that place, but it was for, it was the center for the whole of the Roman Empire. Now, when a, a, a Babylonian priest about 67 uh, BC, uh, sorry, AD, uh, died, a tell, this was Atullus the third. He left the Babylonian priesthood to the Roman emperors because he hadn't got any any children to pass the priesthood on to. And, um, and uh, the Roman emperors who had been worshipping there willingly, willingly took on this role of Babylonian priest. So when we get to the time of Constantine, who, by the way, was never a Christian, um, the story about him seeing a cross in the, in the, in the cloud when he was going to war wasn't written or even referenced at all until 200 years after his death that was made up um, when Constantine takes on the Babylonian priesthood if you imagine Constantine is a, not only a, an excellent military leader and political leader but now he's also a religious leader so now he controls the whole uh, of the, the society's uh, religious, political, and military life within the empire in 320 AD. So, so in 321, as a Babylonian priest who would was a Mithras worshipper, as was the original Babylonian priest, it was important for him to make a proclamation stating that the day of rest would be Sunday in, on, uh, in honor of Sol Invictus. You know, Sol Invictus. <clears throat> this is historical fact. <clears throat> now, um, that uh, Babylonian priesthood was passed along as Constantine died, passed it to the next um, uh, emperor who carried the Babylonian priesthood with him until 381. And a, an emperor called Galatia, for some reason, refused to take on the Babylonian priesthood. Now, some assume that he was a, 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 wanted to go back to the original Christianity, and who knows? I have no idea really why Galatia didn't want to take on the Babylonian priesthood in 381. But in place was a bishop in Rome called Damasus, who was quite a cruel and vicious man, actually. He, um, uh, if we look at the history, he'd killed 12 of his opponents to get to that place of bishop. He took on the Babylonian priesthood. And he inaugurated, was inaugurated by the emperor as a Babylonian priest. Now, a Babylonian priest was referred to as the pontiff, as I've mentioned, the bridge between heaven and earth. And that's why the pope is called pontiff today. That's why when we look at the Pope's blessing with the two fingers blessing, we see uh, what we're seeing is the blessing of the Babylonian priesthood. It's not a blessing of, uh, of any of the disciples or the apostles. The, the blessings that they would use is from number six. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. And, uh, and that's the blessing. <clears throat> 
not this uh, depiction of this blessing with the fingers. And that's why we see, um, if you look at uh, the, the uh, Rome today, uh, outside the Basilica, we see this figure of who Rome claimed to be Peter um, holding his fingers up as the Babylonian priest. Um, that statue, which is said to be Peter, was actually there 200 years before uh, uh, Yeshua. It was 200 years BC because the, the, the statue is of Jupiter, not Peter. So um, we see that Damasus was quite a figure in changing uh, Christianity to become a pagan religion and that's why we see the priests today and the pope and and people wearing uh, the hats uh, the, the mitre which is the the symbol of dagon the god that's why we see the the beautiful purple robes etc which were the robes of the babylonian priest and that's why we see christmas and easter being enforced in the roman empire right throughout history so um that's why Christianity is so different from its origins is because it's being led from uh, 381 AD by a Babylonian priest. Um, so that's where we, that's why we see this um, change, these changes from the original appointed feasts of God to the pagan feasts um, of the, the Babylonian priests. Now, I studied at Yad Vashem, and whilst I was there, a, uh, a man called uh, uh, Franklin H. Littell came to lecture, and by then he was 80 years of age. He was a Methodist minister who was an expert on anti-Semitism, and actually he wrote uh, a, a really good book on this subject called The Crucifixion of the Jews. I think I've mentioned that before to you. Um, and it, it's worth getting on. You can get that on the internet, on Amazon, just for crucifixion of the Jews, Franklin H. Littell, and, uh, and it's very cheap. Now, I asked uh, uh, Franklin Littell, what, what was the, um, the outcome, the consequences of these changes that took place in early history, in the early history of the church? And he said this, he said, it was a triumph of paganism over the Christian movement of the day. And it caused the bishops to serve the state and not the church. And he said, of course, it was bad for the Jews. Now, we know that uh, those changes went through uh, the whole of the British Isles, through the uh, Whitby um, uh, uh, synod the visit by Wilfred and then Augustine on the Welsh churches and we know that the changes were made by force um, and a historian called A.C. Flick says when referring to the Welsh church of this period he says the believers resented the effort to stigmatize them as Judaizers because they conscientiously believed that the seventh day of the fourth commandment was binding. So the word Judaizing was a, 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 a word that was accusatory of, of people who taught that we should be keeping Sabbath. So people like me, I would be accused of being Judaizing and uh, I would be executed. So, and Flick says that, that to be stigmatized by Judaizing when we should be keeping the things of Judaism uh, was an offense to the early church. And uh, uh, his, another historian, J.W. Willis Bunn, said about this period, he said the issue was at once shifted from a fight, and this is, I always found this very interesting, a fight between Christianity and paganism to a fight, and he said, he writes, a deadly fight between the Latin and the Celtic churches. So we see uh, replacement theology really, or replacement Judaism being part of this whole replacement theology uh, movement of the early church 
which comes through to today. It's still there today. And we see um, we see replacement theology in some of the old Bibles as well. We see in the old King James Bible, in the headings there of Isaiah 43 and 44, the headings there are God comforteth the church. Well, Isaiah was a prophet to comfort the nation of Israel, not the church, as you, as you know. And in the Book of Common Prayer, it enforces uh, the, that we sh that Christendom should practice the ways of Christmas and Easter and Sunday. And, and, act, and that was dated 1661. And the Book of Common Prayer actually was, a, people say, well, it's a lovely book and we love to, to, to have it, but it was actually more than a guide of worship. It was an instruction. It was legislation really for how Christendom was to carry out its, its daily duties and celebrations. Um, one of the most famous uh, uh, um, uh, commentators within Christendom is a man called Matthew Henry, who actually, and strangely enough, uh, lived about 200 years ago in Bangor on Dee, where all those Christians were killed. And, and, uh, and in his abridged commentary on Luke 17, 20 to 37, he says this. He says, when Christ came to destroy the Jewish nation by the Roman armies, that is a complete and utter uh, lie. And he, he goes on to say as well, he says, the judgments that are to destroy the Jewish nation, to lay them waste and to deliver the Christians from them, shall fly like lightning through the land. That the setting up of the kingdom of the Messiah would introduce the destruction of the Jewish nation. Now, what does Paul the Apostle say? Well, in Romans 11, verse 1, he says, did God reject his people? And then he says, by no means. He didn't. In fact, he teaches in Romans 15, 27, that we owe a debt to the Jews because we share with their spiritual blessings. He says, we, when we follow Yeshua, we're actually part of the spiritual blessings of the Jewish people and we should be keeping those feasts and, and uh, fast, uh, the, the Sabbath. Romans 2.14, Paul says, Gentiles should keep the Torah through love on our, on our hearts. And in Romans 3 verse 28 to 31, he teaches that we should uphold the Torah. If you, if you, if you if find it very difficult to understand, go to Romans and look at 28 to 31 of chapter 3. And, and he actually says, do we do away this Torah because of our faith? He says, by no means do we do away with the Torah, which is the first five book of, books of the Bible. And then he uh, admonishes the some of the early believers in Galatians 4, 6 to 11, because he says they're going back to their old miserable ways of keeping pagan, pagan festivals. And um, in, in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, he's, Paul instructs us to keep the Passover. So um, <laughs> we really need to get back to our history and really need to understand how the church has moved from a place of being part of the Jewish people, following, uh, you know, in a synagogue, following who uh, the early church believed was Yeshua, the Messiah, to this church that actually uh, keeps the pagan feast that uh, God asked the Jewish people to teach against, if you like. Um, so we can actually look at Sabbath in, um, in, in terms of church theology, and we see that the Catholic press and the Catholic church and the Anglican churches, all of the Anglican denominations from uh, Methodists such as Charles Buck who accept that Saturday is the proper day of rest. Um, Catholic Church says that they had the authority to change it under Constantine but uh, Charles Buck the Methodist says Sabbath in the Hebrew language signifies rest and is the seventh day of the week and Buck says and it must be confessed that there is no law in the New Testament concerning the first day. Presbyterian publication, The Christian at Work, dated the 19th of April, 
1983, uh, to January 19, 1884, not, sorry, 18th of April, 1883 um, to 1884, says, says this, some have tried to build the observance of Sunday upon apostolic command. Whereas the apostles gave no command on the matter at all, the truth is so, so soon as we appeal to the literal scripture, meaning to the scriptures, the literal writing of the Bible, the Sabbatarians, those who keep the Sabbath, have the best of the argument. And then we see Bishop Isaac William, who was the founder of the Wiley College of, in, the USA, in the USA. He says, we are told in scripture that we are to keep the first, sorry, where are we told? in scripture that we are to keep the first day at all we are commanded to keep the seventh but we are nowhere commanded to keep the first day the reason why we keep the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh day is for the same reason that we observe many other things not because the bible says but because the church has enjoined it and um, 1949, uh, Philip Carrington of the Episcopalian Church in the, in the United States says, the Bible commandment says, on the seventh day thou shalt rest. That is Saturday. Nowhere in the Bible is it laid down that worship should be on a Sunday. And um, uh, Harold Linsdale, who was the editor of Christianity Today on the 5th of November 1976, said, there is nothing in scripture that requires us to keep Sunday rather than Saturday as a holy day. Now, I just before we finish, and I know we're right at the end here now, I want to mention what has happened in the UK to enforce Sunday worship against Saturday worship. Well, as the, uh, the UK uh, under Henry VIII and uh, the kings and queens that, uh, of the 16th and 17th century, we see that the Protestant movement, the Reformation movement, came into the British Isles and established a Protestant or a Anglican, if you like, um, a, a, a society. And Catholics were, were forced to be a, a, a minority worship group. And, um, and from the time of the Reformation, the Anglican Church then, under the, with the Book of Common Prayer and the calendar that they carried from the Catholic Church into the British Isles, they commanded that Sunday was the day of rest, as we've just said, but it was now a Protestant um, a decree as well and to, en to en enforce Sunday as a day of rest they caused the government to create laws such as the Conventicles Act of 1553 which allowed imprisonment without bail of those over the age of 16 who failed to attend church on a Sunday who persuaded others to do the same who denied Her Majesty's authority and masters of ecclesiastical laws and who attended unlawful religious conventicles, meaning meetings outside of the Church of England, such as um, uh, Sabbath meetings, they were to be arrested and taken to the courts. And the Conventicles Act was amended in 1664 and that forbade people to meet outside the Church of England. Um, and uh, that legislation was joined with other legislation and it came to be known as the Clarendon Code, which um, aimed at preventing non-conformism of worship within the British Isles. And um, people were arrested and taken to um, a prison for up to 10 years. A man called Albert Jesse and his wife were in prison for 10, 10 years because they kept Sabbath worship. And, and I've written an awful lot about the, um, those, this period of time where people would, Sabbath keepers would meet in uh, forests, in woodlands, in secret, and actually Church of England wardens would follow them 
and, uh, and and arrest them and take them to the courts and and i've been around many of the archives in the uk <coughs> and gathered evidence about the charges that were made against these people who kept sabbath and refused to go to church on a sunday and they were fined 20 shillings in some case or 40 shillings for a second offense uh, there was uh, m many led pieces of legislation which stopped uh, uh, people meeting on a Saturday. In 1618, a man called John Trask and his wife were imprisoned. In uh, 1664, a man called uh, Edward Sennett was imprisoned. And uh, he wrote to the USA, um, his Sabbath keeping friends in the USA, and he said this, in, this was in 1668. As a result of this uh, legislation that was brought about to stop people keeping Sabbath and forcing them to, to the church into the Church of England uh, services on a Sunday, he says, "We have passed great opposition." This is a, a, a quote from a letter he wrote to his American friends. In uh, we have passed through great opposition for the truth's sake, repeatedly from our brethren which makes the affliction heavier. I dare not say how heavy, lest it should seem incredible, but the Lord has been with us, affording us strength according to our day. And when lovers and friends seem to be moved far from us, the Lord was near to us, comforting our souls and quickening us with such quick and eminent answers to our prayers. Here in England, today about nine or ten churches that keep the sabbath besides many scattered disciples who have been eminently preserved in this tottering day when once many eminent churches have been scattered into pieces and he's talking about sabbath churches scattered because of the conventicles act and the um, clarendon Co Co code um, legislation uh, there was a um, people like Thomas Banfield, who, who had been a speaker in Cromwell's Parliament in 1692, was imprisoned, um, and and a, a lot of people were punished for keeping the Sabbath. But the last person to be executed in the British Isles for keeping Sabbath and refusing to keep Sunday is uh, a, a, a reverend, a pastor called John James. Uh, and I'll read you the, what I, my notes on, on John James. Reverend John James was one of the first, if not the first pastor of the Seventh-day Baptist Church worshipping in Bullstake Alley, Whitechapel Road, London. And that church was also called the Milliard Church. So if you want to research that, it's the Milliard Church. On the 19th of October, 1661, whilst preaching to his people at their meeting place, he was twice interrupted by officers of the law and commanded to come down. He was dragged out of his pulpit. He was ordered to be executed. And despite appeals to King Charles II, who was the king then, he was hung, drawn and quartered and his head stuck on a pole outside his church. So we see that replacement theology and replacement Judaism has not been something that uh, has uh, has been without pain and suffering throughout history. And the last reference um, we see within Christendom was this reference to uh, John James in 1661, who was executed because he taught that we should be keeping the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. So I hope I've been able to impart some information to you tonight and i hope that it's not been too challenging now as i say if you need to ask any questions please email me and um, and i'll try to answer the best i can i've studied this now for uh, uh, nearly 20 years and um, and, I, and i've got a lot of history and a lot of uh, documents and uh, archive documents and a lot of books as well i can um, uh, give you references to so so please feel free to do that but uh, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Next week, we will look at uh, Holocaust. Um, you can also look at the Holocaust teaching that I'm doing on YouTube. Although tomorrow, we're not, I'm not doing the teaching tomorrow. 
Uh, I will be resuming a week tomorrow on Holocaust. But for us as a Hidden Treasures course, we'll be looking at Holocaust and looking at some of the principles in Holocaust. So uh, I look forward to seeing you again um, next, next week, next Tuesday night at seven o'clock. So from my home, Bethel House in North Wales, uh, good night and Lila Toff.